Okay, yeah, and then, so for Kai, Kai is the CEO of Mercurix, a people and analytics startup focusing on computational psychology. He previously worked as a recruitment consultant specializing in tech. After working 10 years in the HR industry from recruitment to L&D, Kai noticed a gap between companies and its people. Employers not knowing enough to bring out the best in their employees, a gap that can be closed using data. So with a background in psychology and a passion for tech recruitment, he and his team has, at Mercurix plan to help companies big and small, hire, train, and retain better through computational psychology from getting the right feet to correctly ex assessing performance. Yeah, and take it away, Kai. Oh, thanks. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you, you already shared quite a bit about me. Um, so yeah, I, I actually graduated in a with a Bachelor of Psychology. So uh, yeah, not tech related. Um, I spent many years in HR, everything from learning and development to internal HR BP, to internal talent acquisition, to recruitment consultancy. And when I was working in, as a recruitment consultant uh, for one and a half years at Robert Walters, I was specifically recruiting for analytics. That means like data engineering, data scientists, business intelligence analysts, so on and so forth. That was my main focus. Um, However, before we kind of start, I, I wanted to, how do I do this? Uh, I wanted to do a little poll on um, how many people are actually in this, in this group right now um, are currently working in tech or who is not working in tech. And there's a yes or no. So what you can do is you can go at the bottom, you can click on participants and there's a yes and no button. So I would like all of you just, to, if you are working in tech at the moment, click yes. If you are not look, working in tech, press no, just to give me a kind of general feel. I can't see the results. So far, it's uh, 15 yes and 17 no. Okay. All right. So we got quite a few people not. Okay. That gives me a good kind of feel. So I can focus on that a little bit more. All right. Um, in that case, since I believe mo a lot of people are you are quite interested to kind of get into, into tech, um, I'll share a bit more on, focus a bit more on that. Um, so yeah, obviously, I'm not from a tech background. Um, how did I get in this kind of position? It's a bit different. It's not really so much like in applying for a job. It's more like, uh, yeah, I, I run a company now. So it's a bit different. Um, but the way that I moved into this space was that I saw there was a massive gap in data utilization within HR. And this was something like five years ago. I realized there was an underutilization of, um, you know, training needs analysis data, um, training feedback data, uh, data on uh, performance evaluations and a whole lot of stuff like that. So that got me initially interested and I did on online courses and data science. Um, they had a lot of online courses back then. And what I actually then did is a bit unusual. So my next jump was actually to recruitment consultant and within an agent agency. And when I got that job, I only specifically requested to recruit for the data science slash analytics desk. Okay. I would only recruit these kind of people. And the reason I did that was because that gave me the opportunity to speak to these kind of people every single day for one and a half years. So I used to dig their people's brains. So imagine I interview people and I said, okay, what kind of data do you have available within your organization? How do you utilize that data? Um, what did you build from that data? What kind of insights did you get out of that data? So this was basically my kind of job for one and a half years. And I was not so much focused on placing people other than just, uh, learning for myself. So generally when recruitment students interview somebody, they interview someone for like, like 15 to half an hour, half an hour. My, my interviews would go for like 45 minutes to an hour because I would go into detail. I had candidates sit down with me at a table and they'd draw me how, how the whole architecture of the database works and stuff like that. So that kind of got me on my own personal interest. Um, and then I, I actually joined Mercury X, um, as a startup initially as a product director and project manager. Um, and then I took over as CEO um, one year ago. So I was in Mercury for close to two years now. 
but I took over as CEO um, a year ago. So yeah, what we do is in the domain of computational psychology. So we basically, our company consists of psychologists and computer scientists. Um, that's basically the gist of it. So we have data scientists working together with organizational psychologists, mostly. Um, we do projects, um, everything from population sentiment analysis, feedback analysis, um, topic analysis on what people are saying about what's going on. We do uh, personality assessments, um, pre-employment assessments, job satisfaction surveys, things like that. Um, we also do create models on assessing financial risk. Um, that was for like a hedge, for like a fund and things like that. So that's how we've been operating mainly for the past two years as a uh, kind of consultancy firm. And we also now have a platform. We have two platforms, Selfie Corporate and Selfie Personal. Um, these, I, I'm sharing a link so people, you can try them out when you're free. Uh, Selfie Corporate is basically a behavioral assessment platform for organizations. So it lets you easily just log in, register, um, choose different types of behavioral assessments and send them out to your pre-existing staff or who, if someone, if you want to hire somebody, it's like pre-employment assessments as well. And what I realized was that um, a lot of times these personality assessments or pre-employment assessments, they're siloed. What that means is that you usually do it once and it ends there. That data isn't being reutilized in the future. So what we do is if you hire somebody and you have their initial assessment and you can tie it up with some pre-existing data about you know, what kind of job they're doing, their employment history, from there, you can then track it. You can then compare their pre-employment assessment to some behavioral assessments within the team, to their job satisfaction surveys, and so on and so forth. So we, we want to realize this kind of data from the start of the employee lifecycle all the way towards you know, the end. We even uh, provide uh, exit surveys if someone leaves the company. Um, so this is the kind of stuff we're doing. Uh, recently, uh, just one and a half weeks ago, there was a mental health day. So we provide a mental well-being assessment, and this is extremely important right now with COVID. Um, so if any of you are part of a team currently, or you're a team lead, you can actually log on to Selfie Corporate, selfiecorp.ai, go to the mental well-being survey, and you can send it out to your colleagues. Um, this is good, so you can kind of see that, you know, how everyone's doing, especially during COVID. It's a nice little thing to do just to make sure everyone's all right, right? Then there's selfie.ai, which we call selfie personal. It's basically a site where you can do a whole bunch of different personality assessments for yourself. Selfie.ai is free to use. And we realized, we built this because we realized that a lot of personality assessments out there are free, yes, but they're only located on one, for example, one type of assessment is located on one site, or another type of assessment is located on a different site. So we collate everything together and what you have is all that data for yourself to tell you more about yourself. You have an overall profile and this overall profile, what we actually have is some background technology, which we have from ASTAR because we are an ASTAR spin-off company. And this uh, model, what it does, it does inferences on traits. So if you do a, on selfie.ai, if you do some personality assessments about yourself, you get inferences of your other traits. Okay, so it, it predicts other traits based on what you have, you know, completed for assessments, okay? So yeah, that is Mercurix. If you're interested, uh, yeah, you can play around with the two links that I sent out and any questions you can reach out to me as well on the Telegram chat later. All right, so the objective actually today is to talk a little bit more about uh, seek finding a job in, in, you know, finding a job specifically for tech. Okay, um, usually when I conduct a talk for this, it, it's two hours long. <laughs> it goes everything from understanding yourselves to preparing your CVs and everything and all the way to the end of it. What we're gonna focus on today is a bit on uh, where can you apply for jobs? How do you apply for jobs and preparing for the interview? That's the main thing that we'll be focused on, on today. Okay, um, so most of the time people the traditional way to apply is number five it's job portals but i've ranked these according to the most uh 
the highest chance you'll get a job to the least chance you'll get a job, right? So number one is personal networks. It's the number one method to get a job. And especially if you're, for example, not working in technology, um, if you know someone who is, or you have a business owner friend or a manager who works in this, maybe your friend runs a startup uh, and you can probably you know, ask, hey, you know, would you take on a project manager? for example, that you know, is not in tech yet, but while you're there, you can also pick up skills for, from experience. So that could be one example, if you know somebody. Um, number two is the best way to uh, you know, get a job um, is through recommendations. Okay, recommendations through your personal networks or recommendations through previous engagements. Um, one of this could be like an internship that you went through previously so you can go back to the previous boss, previous manager and ask him, hey, um, are you hiring now that I've you know, finished my course or I've graduated or things like that? Or you can even ask them, hey, do you know anybody that is hiring at the moment? Okay, so the best way to always get an opportunity is to always ask around. Even for me, when I used to be a recruitment consultant, I would always ask, do you know anybody that is hiring? Or do you know anyone that is looking for a job? It works the reverse as well. So the number one method also, if I were to hire somebody, would be through personal recommendations. Okay. Number three is direct outreach. Um, this is a bit intimidating because it's a bit like cold calling. And one of the perfect tools for this is LinkedIn. Um, so what you can do on LinkedIn is do you see a job opening on a job portal, for example, um, within Procter & Gamble or Hitachi or whatever kind of organization, and you see that it's for a specific department under a specific uh, you know, head, department head. You can actually search for this person on LinkedIn and you can connect to them, write a short little message and say, hey, I'm really interested in what you're doing. I'm looking into getting you know, into this field, uh, could we connect, for example? And once you connect, you can open up a chat that you can have a discussion with them and say like, hey, you know, um, I saw there was an opening. Are you guys hiring? I'm interested in this opening. That's an example of a direct outreach. Other ways is there are ways to get certain email addresses. You can also email them directly if you have their contact or if someone recommends you uh, or passes you an email, you can reach out to them and say, hey, um, you know, this is my cover letter attached to my CV. I'm really keen to work with you guys. Um, yeah, this is me, for example. Fourth is recruiters or recruitment consultants like I used to be. Um, so recruitment consultants, um, the way that they work, the reason I put it as number four is because they represent you also for their own interests. Meaning that if I were to represent you as a candidate, you are of a certain salary level and you are a certain capability because I earn a commission from your total annual salary, basically. So most of the time, if you are a junior developer or if you are a fresh graduate, the chance of you working with a recruiter are quite slim because of, yeah, generally your experience isn't quite there. So most of the time, a recruitment consultant highly likely will not represent you. So that's why I put this as number four, right? Um, number five is job portals. That's the most traditional way. Um, this relies on mainly a pure numbers game. Uh, sending out <laughs> multiple CVs. I know of people that send out like, like up to 200 CVs, 300 CVs to different types of organizations to in hope, in hope that the HR will get back to them. Um, this is also dependent on another factor of how your CV looks like, for example or depending on the type of job portal. Uh, certain job portals, um, what they require is a Word document rather than PDF, where they just scrape the data from your Word doc and then put it into a certain formatting, which is not really in your control. Um, other organizations, you know, if you can have the chance to do up a nice CV, um, it's yeah to your advantage so that it stands out. What I'm going to copy and paste within the chat now are two links. So the first link is basically uh, how to do up your resume. And if you're going to take the, yeah, either way you should do up a good resume. Your resume tips, this is basically following the XYZ formula. Um, I'm not going to go into detail with it because it takes quite some time. Um, but you can click on that link on you know, how to 
what are your odds, improve your odds of getting hired at Google. That's a good example. Um, and then the Canva is come and CV layouts. So you can use that um, on your own time, but I won't go through it at the moment. Okay. All right. So right now, uh, this is a question that I get asked quite a bit um, at this current point, especially with COVID happening and a lot of organizations letting people go. Um, how is the job market for tech right now? Um, it's good. It's still fine. Don't worry. Um, tech is still hiring. Um, it's, it's an industry that hasn't really been affected by COVID-19. Uh, it comes with its benefits that a lot of developers can work remotely. And generally, people that work in tech, they're a, lot, yeah, they're a lot more adapted to this kind of situation of working from home than other kinds of job functions. So tech job market is still quite good. Um, and yeah, I know that a lot of organizations are still actively hiring for tech. Um, there, for those, if there are fresh graduates in here or people that have recently graduated with a master's, um, that leaves you the option to apply for traineeship programs. So recently, um, yeah, there's been a lot of traineeships available, but then I get the question, should I apply for traineeships? So this, the answer to this really depends on your current situation and your own finances, for example. Um, if you are a late career individual, a uh, late career job switcher, and you have uh, dependents like kids or you, you know, finances, stuff like that, then of course the cap for traineeship is 2.5K. So that one is an issue. Um, if you are a fresh grad bachelor's with no dependencies, then it's easier for you to pick up a traineeship program for example, because of that amount, okay? All right, <clears throat> so I'm just gonna go a little bit through uh, two parts. Uh, this one is about interview prep soft skills mainly. After this, I'll go through a bit more about technical skills and interview for uh, prep for technical interviews, All right? So um, <laughs> I got a little story first. Um, this might seem basic to a number of people, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't prepare for interviews or even face-to-face -face interviews, anything like that. There was uh, an example of one person who actually was going for a data scientist opening at Rio Tinto. If you don't know, Rio Tinto is a large Australian mining company. They've been around for quite a long time. They're huge. They have an office at Marina Bay Financial Center. So if you think about MBFC, you already know from the people that walk around there how they dress, um, you know, and yeah, just basically how, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. There, there, there are a lot of banks around there. Um, when this person went for the interview, she didn't prepare at all. And it was even to a point when she turned up to the location in slippers and shorts. And to me, I, I was shocked, obviously, because I met her there and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, uh, do research on the company, please. Um, in tech, a lot of times, the, the, you know, generally it's quite casual, especially in startups, you know, for guys, polo tee, jeans kind of thing, it's cool, that's good enough. Um, but just to be safe, if you're unsure, it's better to dress up rather than dress down, um, just to be safe. So yeah, this, this person, she came in shorts and slippers, which was the total wrong thing to do, especially for a company that works, that has an office in MBFC. Um, she also then asked me, where's the office location? What floor is it? Um, and what is the job that was thinking? So what was the job again? That one blew my mind. Okay, so this is just a completely bad case and a bad, bad a very, very uh, say extreme example. Okay, so first things, yes, research the company, go online, find out what they're doing, go to an extent, find, go through the news, find out what, you know, what have they been doing recently? If it's a startup, check their fundraising, how much money have they raised, go on to Crunchbase. Crunchbase is an excellent one for startups. Um, see how money there is. Go on LinkedIn. Go find out how many people are working in that organization, in the startup. If you are applying for a big organization, you can find out, uh, you know, who's the 
potential boss, who's in his team, things like that, and try to find out. And this kind of preparation will also prepare you to then, you know, ask potential questions. Okay. So that's basics of preparing to, you know, research in the company. The other one that most people don't know to do is to also do research on the interviewer. And most people then ask me, how do I do this? Um, how do I even know who's interviewing me? Um, that's up to your own initiative. If you pass the initial phase of speaking to HR and HR, for example, arranges an interview, you can always ask the HR, right? Who is it will be interviewing me? Um, do you mind letting me know? Can you send me their LinkedIn? Or if not, just their names, right? And then with that information, you can go on LinkedIn, you can go, you know, find out a bit about themselves, uh, about them, you know, what was the background? What is their experience like? This will also give you an opportunity to find out a little bit more about who you would potentially be reporting to. And the other thing is, it's always, so there, there's one thing here, it's also good to have small talk to build rapport. So if you go on LinkedIn, you see recent activity, you can see what kind of stuff they like, uh, what kind of talks they've attended, what kind of stuff they comment on. Um, and yeah, these are conversation starters. So you can see that, oh, okay, this person gave a talk at one of the Google um, you know, events. And then you know this during the interview, you can throw it out. Oh, hey, um, I saw your talk. It's really interesting. Blah, blah, blah. Tell me a bit about that. Okay. This is rapport building. This will increase your chances. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Next up, prepare questions. Um, this is really important. And even me, if I hire somebody, I always look out for this. Um, it shows interest. You know, if at the end of the interview, if the interview asks you, um, you know, do you have any questions and you say no, most of the time it's a red flag. It means this person, he didn't do his research on the company. He's not interested in what we're doing. Um, yeah, it's, it's a major red flag. So, you know, always prepare a set of questions before you go for an interview. Right. Even during the initial call with, for example, if, if the call is with initially with HR, you can even ask potentially the HR some stuff about the company. Okay. All right. Uh, next thing, be courteous. Um, punctuality by right, I would think that people you, I wouldn't even have to talk about, but you'd be amazed at how often, especially nowadays that people take people's other people's time for granted, be punctual, right? turn up like 10 minutes early, 15 minutes early. Don't turn up like half an hour early, lah, but just like 10 minutes is good enough, lah, right? And even after the interview, follow up, right? Be the, take the initiative and be the first one to email the person back, right? Thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed meeting you. I'm so keen to, you know, you know find out more about your company, so on and so forth, okay? Just pleasantries. These things, these little, little things matter. Like there have been several occasions where even when I speak to someone on the phone for an opening, um, I send them some information about the company and there's not even a reply. And sure, maybe someone doesn't want the job, but I'm going back to the previous slide about um, recommendations, number two. Even if you know I liked you and I felt that you weren't a good fit, into maybe a role with me or whatever, I potentially still could recommend you to someone else within my network, right? So if you reply to me and I might have rejected you, it's fine. At least that I know that, okay, this person's courteous. He still followed up and with me and, you know, through an email, so on and so forth. Maybe if I know that one of my fellow startup friends is hiring or looking for a front-end developer, for example, I know, okay, I just interviewed this front-end dev. I didn't want to hire him, but maybe my friend will. Okay, so these things matter. You might not think it, but it really does in the long term. Okay, um, practice number five, the last one. Um, interviewing is a skill that you learn, especially if you are a late career switcher or a, you know, a fresh grad, someone that hasn't recently been um, interviewing or attending interviews. It is a skill that you learn. It's also, if you haven't attended one for a long time, you lose it. Because interviewing or attending an interview 
it's an uncomfortable situation. We generally feel very uncomfortable being in a room or now mainly over Zoom um, with maybe being interviewed by two or three other people, right? We are nervous, we are anxious, and it's totally normal to feel that way. And the only way to not feel that way is to get used to that kind of feeling. Um, but role playing is one way of doing it with a friend. However, there's another avenue. And this is a trick that we used to do as recruitment consultants. Okay, we used to at times send some of our candidates to jobs that we didn't want them to get. So, for example, <laughs> um, if I wanted to place a data scientist at a very large organization, but I also have some other vacancies that potentially are available, I would send him to these other vacancies as well. So, this person would get practice in interviewing before the big one. So I would give him some practice, one or two interviews before that, before I send him to the third one, which is the one that I know he, he wants and I know I want him to get. Um, so you could actually potentially do the same thing for yourself. If you apply for certain jobs and people get back to you, um, don't deny it. Don't say that, oh, no, no, actually, I want a different type, different kind of job. Just go and attend it first, right? You never know, you might actually like it, okay? So that's kind of a way to kind of get some practice out there. Um, attend interviews, even if you don't say 100% that you want it, just attend it for practice. And then when the job comes around that you really, really want, you'll be more prepared. Okay. All right. Okay, a bit about technical interviews. Most of the time, um, based on my experience as a tech recruiter, um, technical interviews do not happen at the start. Most of the time for larger organizations, it's generally the HR that will call you first, ask some generic questions, and then set up a face-to-face -face with the hiring manager. And then after that, they will follow up with a technical interview when they're doing the, you know, the third, second or third kind of point. Um, sometimes if they are generic technical tests that are available online, um, some organizations use this as a way to shortlist, okay? Um, but these kind, of, these kind of mass market tests, uh, from a higher perspective, I wouldn't use them because the information and the answers are always available online. They are quite easy to bypass um, generic tests uh, or assessments. It's very easy. You know, you just Google something and then you can find some information on, on forums or something and then you can pass that kind of technical test, the generic ones. Um, the better ones generally happen later on in the interview process. Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the main things generally for uh, preparing for technical interviews is to make sure that whatever you put on your CV matches with your skills. Um, I've seen some people, they put a whole bunch of different, like they put Python, R, and then Java, C Sharp, blah, blah, blah. And the list is never ending. And then they can actually, their only main strength is Python. They just put the rest as just filler. So don't put it if you are not strong in it, okay? Because you will get questioned about it. And if you get questioned about it and they assess you on it, you, you kind of dug your own grave, right? So mainly lists, some CVs, they have a little bar next to it where, you know, if I put Python, I put like four out of five and then yeah, that, that one works too. At least it gives you uh, the interviewer and understanding that yes, okay, you, you are mainly uh, focused on Python, but you have skill sets in others, programming languages, for example. Okay. Um, yep. So be prepared to answer questions on how proficient you are and how many years of programming experience you have in that language. Okay. And how many projects you've worked on utilizing that. Okay. And other things is yes, uh, state. If you work on an XY, XYZ project, be prepared to describe the techni in technical details on what you utilize, what kind of technology you utilize on those projects. Okay. And most of the time, your interviewer will be technical themselves. So it's get technical too. I, I've seen some where people try to talk in layman and it doesn't do them any benefit, la, right? Um, when you talk about the projects, you need to be able to highlight what was technically difficult about that project. You know, why uh, was it difficult for you? How did you overcome those challenges? What did, 
how did you find a solution to overcome those challenges? Right. Um, and what kind of framework you used for that project as well? These are the kind of things they ask. So if your CV also states that you've worked on a technical project, you need to be prepared to answer what role you played in that team. So if there was a project team, you need to be able to explain, okay, uh, I was the UI UX de designer, or I was the front end developer, or I was the back end architect, so on and so forth, right? Um, if it's a technical interview and you say that, hey, I was the project manager for this, project for this technical project the project manager it, it's it's not really a kind of it requires technical understanding but not of course a full technical role so they might question you on this kind of stuff yep all right um next so number two be very familiar with data structures and algorithms so this is especially important actually it's generally important lot but more so the requirement from what i've seen as a recruitment consultant it's more required in the bigger tech firms like your google and your facebook Okay. Yeah. Uh, so during this time, they might ask you, just be prepared to answer questions to why you chose to solve a certain problem in a certain way. Okay. Was it because of memory efficiency? Was it because of enhanced processing time? Um, things like that. There are some tips which I can send out to you guys. I'm going to put a few links in the chat again. Um, these are some resources on prepping for technical interviews, okay? Um, I'll put them there now, they're in the chat, and later on, I'll also put them in the Telegram group chat. Oh, oh wait, okay, there we go. Uh, it's because I copy and paste it from a notepad. All right. Okay, next thing number three, be somewhat familiar with software engineering practices. So for example, use of Git versioning control, uh, test-driven development, agile methodology. Um, most of the time, these kind of requirements will also be in the job description. So you know, if you know, they generally work in agile methodology, it would state that as well, right? Um, other thing when it comes to actually Git is something I forgot to mention. Uh, in the previous one, when it comes to your CVs, it's good to include, um, to include a link of your GitHub in there and don't leave it empty. Make sure it's been active recently because uh, hiring managers do check that, right? And the last one, of course, is basically the topic of this practice, 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 be prepared, right? Um, I just provide you a whole bunch of links. Oh, really? Oh yeah, correct, but still in technical interviews. So there's a lot of sites that provide you information, which I've shared, just, yeah, um, prepare and practice. Um, one of the main questions that most interviews always ask is, why do you want to join us? And don't answer smart, like saying, oh, because there's an opening or, oh, because I need a job. Um, I've had people say that to me. It's not, it might sound funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> um, you might think I don't have a sense of humor, but no, it, it, it's, after you hear it a few times, it's, it's not entertaining. Uh, okay. State why you want it, why do you think you would be good in it, and what will you help achieve, right? A lot of the times when someone, uh, okay, sorry. So a lot of times when someone, uh, yeah, applies, what's important for me as well is that when you join an organization that you also learn, there has to be personal growth for, for you as an individual. If there's no personal growth, um, that is a red flag as well. Because then, you know, if it stagnates um, within one, two years, the person would probably leave. So it's important to make sure that, you know, you, you think about uh, how you're going to personally grow within that organization itself. This can also be a consideration for you whether you should join the company or not. Okay. Uh, most of the time when I hire somebody, I'll ask them, you know, what are, what are a few things and how are you going to contribute to the company? And, you know, how is the company going to contribute back to you as well with your learning? and your exposure and your personal growth, All right? All right, um, I put first in quotes because uh, I'm not quite sure of all the demographics that we have in here when it comes to your current job role and stuff. Um, so I don't know if you're all fresh grads or some people are mid-career switchers, but um, let's say if you do start 
newly in tech, right? What do you prioritize? Do you prioritize personal growth? Do you prioritize salary? Um, salary for tech in the market is generally higher. So and that's one thing to consider. Um, so the question is, what do I prioritize? But my recommendation, generally, if you're a fresh grad or if you're a mid-career switcher, focus on growth. Um, that's the most important at this standpoint, right? Because um, your future will be determined on how much you learn at the start of that career or career switch, right? And sometimes I get asked, oh, what kind of company should I join? Um, and as an example, I actually find that startups are a very good option if you are new to tech, right? If you're a fresh grad or if you, uh, if you are mid, like late career switcher. The reason for this is because when it comes to you know, exposure, it gives you quite a bit of exposure to doing different types of things. Um, you might go from full stack to focus men, mainly only on front end development or you know, different kind of things. But of course, as Shane was sharing just now uh, within GovTech, he had the opportunities to switch as well. So that's great. Um, but I, yeah, he shared a bit about that already. So, but generally, I find that if you're quite unsure at the start and you want to explore what your interests are when it comes to working in tech, startups are a great place to start, right? Um, starting salary. Oh, one thing I mentioned, forgot to mention about follow-ups and interviews. The question I got a lot is when do I ask for salary or when do I ask about salary? Um, never on the first interview, never on the first time of hiring, meeting the hiring manager. Most of the time this is left towards later on in, in, in maybe third interview or third meetup or something like that. If they ask what your expected salary is or they ask um, or the HR asks, that's fine. Then you can start talking about it, right? Um, Managing expectations and self-worth. Uh, so the reason I put this is because there, there is a lot of research. Again, we work in psychology, right? We do a lot of work with a lot of psychological research. There's a big uh, correlation between uh, self-worth and salary, right? People with high self-worth have higher salaries than this stuff. So, so um, that's why I put that in there about managing your own expectations of salary and things like that. Um, but of course, when it comes to managing expectations and salary, um, it's important to note that you don't go out and you throw some ridiculous number out there um, without the experience to back it. Okay, so you got to be kind of realistic. You can do your own market research on what the uh, market is at, and then from there, if they ask you, you know, what what are your what's your demand, what is your salary expectation, then you can answer them. Um, negotiation wise. Uh, if you are a fresh grad or a mid-career switcher and you go from a background non-tech into tech, when it comes to negotiations as either fresh grad or that, uh, you don't have much weight to negotiate. So mainly as fresh grads, most of the salaries are kind of uh, normalized within industry according to the university that you graduated from. For late careers, it can depend but a lot of companies can tap onto uh, grants from our late career switchers. So that can be to your advantage as well. Um, because yeah, they can they get grant support from government law, uh, mainly for, for Singaporeans for this. Okay. Um, last one is have options. Um, when it comes to salary negotiation, it helps if you have options because you are not so desperate just to take that one single offer or that one single job. And it's okay to have options um, because it, again, it's your career, right? So if you, if you exploring two or three different opportunities and you got two job offers, that gives you an advantage because you can decide which one you really want, one month, right? And if you feel that within a salary negotiation, pro negotiation process that you are undervalued, it kind of gives you like, a, it's like a trump card line in a way you know, that you know that, okay, the other person has offered me more. Um, I'm not gonna go into so much detail of this. Um, you can ask me questions in the Telegram chat later because I think we are a bit over time. Oh, yeah, uh, so I'll stop there when it comes to uh, interview prep and some other things. There's more I could potentially share, but we're done for time. Um, I guess we're going to move to Q 
Q&A now. So if you have any questions or you should, will you take over? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you can either type it in the chat or you can just say like here and then we can then get you to say your question with your voice, yeah. So if you have a question either for Kai or Shane, you can you can type it out or you can say like here, here, I want I want to ask a question. So will the slides, uh, will your slides be available later? Yeah, I can share. Cool. Hi, I have a question. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, I know how to code, but then I'm not sure about all the methodologies like uh, Agile or Waterfall, all those kind of thing. So how should I like, you know, proceed on from the knowledge that I have. So I'm like rather familiar with, okay, sanitization, then uh, Ajax, then sending requests, all those programming kind of stuff, like API requests. Cause after all, I, I started out as a self-taught developer, but then onto the theory, all those, I have no knowledge. Yeah. So what if I all is quite, archaic, I say. It's not used very often very anymore. Um, most people, I, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know, how, how, but generally from my experience, it's quite out loud. But um, Agile methodology is, actually there's so many courses online. Um, I actually attended one at some time back, which was, I used my skills, skills future. <laughs> can I, um, so you, you can attend courses. They are like, I know I can, let me, let me go find the link and I'll put it in the Telegram chat later. There's one that offers a two day course, full day. Um, and it's $110 after subsidies if you're Singaporean and uh, you can use your skills future, connect, uh, skills future credits for that. Yeah, so when it comes to these kind of methodologies, uh, yeah, they're online courses or you can attend courses. The other way of course is uh, actually using the methodology, which is a different story. Um, getting that project management experience or working on a technical project. Um, I know there are some uh, groups out there that kind of do tech for good stuff. Um, I have some contacts that are involved with this. So what they actually do is, you know, over weekends or when you have spare time, you can be part of a tech for good project as a developer. Um, I know a friend, she's working on a project that's looking for a front end dev and you know, these kind of things where they're, they're helping, they're building an app for seniors and it's not profit, these kind of things. Lah. So potentially if you have time to spare and you want to gain experience working in a technical team, these are the kind of stuff that I would recommend that you can do. Lah. Yeah, I can try and send, I will fish out some resources and send it in the Telegram chat. Okay, got it, thanks. Actually, Tyler, I think it's interesting that you say that the technical, the theoretical part is the part that you find the most difficult to learn because, I mean, I thought that that one is like where, like uh, learning the theory is where there's more resources, right? But it's where, as Kai mentioned, learning like the practical part, like using it, generally that one is where you have to, to work harder to get opportunities, right? Because you actually have to like work on something related to that. But if it's just the theory, then I mean, there's online courses, there's like even textbooks, right? So I say that because, you know, like, I was I, I was spending my free time reading textbooks on data science when I was working. So like that that's why like you know you, you are able to build up like, I think you're able to build up theory like uh, relatively easier than practical experience. Yeah. yeah, I was actually looking for a job like some months back then. I think that in the job description there were like a lot of theory requirement like DevOps, then after that agile. Then I think there were so many others others that I cannot recall. Then there is also like, okay, let's say PHP, all those kind of thing, which is like, okay, I from what I know, it's like a old language, but I do not know why in the Singapore market, right, it's like still in demand. Yeah. Um, there are some 
some companies that still work on legacy systems that require some older kind of technology stuff. A um, lot are banks actually, um, but that one really depends on yeah the organization now. Yeah. Um, okay, I think I will just wait for the you know for you to share on the volunteer projects. Then I wouldn't mind like getting into it so that you know I have more understanding. Yeah. There's yeah. one more question that came out. Chat. Yeah, on the chat. What kind of impact does online courses have on getting a job in tech? Shane, you want to go first, and then. Yeah, yeah, I can go first. Uh, I mean, I would say that personally, uh, from, I mean, I, I've, I've been on both sides of the fence. Uh, I would say that the online course itself uh, doesn't carry weight, right? It's more of like, how do you show uh, and how do you apply what you've learned from the course? Because like, if I see a resume and I see, okay, I mean, okay, okay. if I see a resume and I see you've done a number of online courses, maybe I'll be like, okay, maybe this, this guy is showing some interest. I could maybe ask him a few questions, right? But that's kind of like a lead in, right? It just, it doesn't automatically qualify you. But it's more like, you know, even if, you, if you've done a lot or you haven't done any, but when I do the technical interview, you're, you're showing me some interesting things. Then I think like, okay, you know, maybe this guy is good. This guy is, is showing that, you know, he, he's really like got, like he's, he's, he's learned a lot of things, uh, even be it through courses or not. So I wouldn't say that courses themselves, are like, you, you need to rack up all the courses, right? Yeah, it's more of just the learning point, so. Yeah, um, so when I look at the CV generally, uh, I look at, if you, I, I, I have nothing against online courses, nothing but good things to say about online courses. And which is great with how things work nowadays, you know, you can get access to so much information. Um, what I look for is, does it fill your gaps? So for example, if there's someone applying as a data scientist and he's a background in physics, right? Uh, he might not be able to work in the technical aspect when it comes to coding might not quite be there. So if I can see that there are some courses that this person took to fill those gaps, that's the th kind of thing that I'll be looking out for. I know that, okay, this person made an effort. He filled in the right gaps that he has with certain online courses. He made an effort to go out and learn it himself. Um, yeah, that's generally what I'll be looking out for. Um, it also depends on the employer. So when I used to be a recruitment consultant in tech, some, of, some organizations are very hard up on hiring someone with a CS background. Um, it's, I, 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 I've seen that we're a bit more progressive now in the last two years, um, where, because I guess also it is such a high demand for people in this industry, lot. but, um, the requirement of having a background in CS is no longer such a huge requirement. Like it used to be some larger organizations are still like that. Um, yeah. So how it, I would say it really depends on the employer and the employer's mindset on the kind of, you know, did you fill your gaps with online courses? Well, I mean, that said, of course, it never hurts to do them. Mm. Uh, I guess I guess the reason why they alone are not seen as like sufficient qualifications is also because, you know, if you go through online course, uh, they, I mean, you can just like post through it, right? Like, without learning anything more than just the bare essentials. Or you really can like dig in and then like you you own stuff like you know when they ask you a certain problem you do your own research you know you branch out you read what other people have done you find out best practices right so these mm -hmm. two people have two completely different experiences right mm -hmm. from the same course so the only way yeah. to, to see about one from the other is really to like see if that guy can demonstrate in any of those skills or... yeah actually um yeah utilizing or actually coming up with pet projects is another way i would I would say there is a probably a limit the amount of online courses that you can put on your CV to a point where it, it no longer becomes, I would say, I would say useful or in a way it's no longer attractive on the CV. I what I would rather then see is maybe you've taken a few online courses and then after that you've done some pet projects. So maybe you have an interest. So for example, I like rock climbing, right? And within the rock climbing community, there's a big issue when it comes to finding rock climbing shoes. So me and a friend got together, tried to develop a computer vision model to then analyze people's speed sizes to then recommend shoe models. This is a pet project. It has nothing to do with my work. It is done out of pure personal interest. But this kind of thing I can put on my CV, for example, that me and him worked together and created something like this. It's impressive. And then you can put it on Git. You know, people can look at your GitHub and that exists. That is more valuable than just taking a ton of online courses.
Anything else? No more questions? No more questions. <laughs> okay, um, I think we're about time also. So um, thank you so much, Shane and Kai. Um, so I have like two announcements over here. First is that if you still have more questions for Shane, you can actually go to the StackX Telegram channel above um, in the chat sidebar. Then you can ask, ask him questions there. And then um, we also have, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so, and then this is a link to a feedback form to today's event. So like super helpful for us. Um, what do you like about today? What do you not like about today? Um, please fill it up and tell us like, so that we can improve and give us, um, give you like better events. So yeah, I think any, I think last words from either Shane or Kai. Um, nope. No, I just hope it was helpful. And if you have any questions, yeah, you can ask in the Telegram chat group. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for everyone for your time today. Um, as the saying goes, you can be anywhere tonight, but you are here today. So thank you so much for your time and see you next time. Thanks, bye. Thank you.